Welcome back to Cybersecurity 180. Today I have a very special treat for you. I was privileged to participate in an event at my local college, Columbia Basin College in Pasco, Washington. Many thanks to the Veterans Education Transition Services Office, the VETS Office, at CBC for putting this together. General Jim Mattis, retired United States Marine Corps, gave a special talk on the Middle East and America's role. General Jim Mattis, an Annenberg Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution, is an expert on national security issues, especially strategy, innovation, the effective use of military force, and the Middle East. He heads a project on the gap between civil and military perspectives and is writing a book on leadership. A native of the Pacific Northwest, General Mattis graduated from Central Washington University in 1972. He is also a graduate of the Amphibious Warfare School, Marine Corps Command and Staff College, and the National War College. He is also a local native of our area. He graduated from Richland High School, then known as Columbia High School, and also attended Jason Lee Elementary. General Jim Mattis, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Semper Vidalis. Brothers and sisters, thank you for watching our video series. Remember to hit like and subscribe and share this video with your friends. If you want to jump forward to the section where I get to ask a question and answer period of Jim Mattis about cyber warfare, especially cyber terrorists of the Middle East and our critical infrastructure. It puts a very clear perspective on what we really need to do as a people. Not more of the scare tactics, but short and sweet, some very good advice that he does have. Again, thank you for watching. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a book that I believe was written in 19 States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
and determined in back to this community to again, again, further service to us by his activities on the hand of the nuclear site, which is near and dear to the hearts of the family members. He has been involved in community service all of his adult life, either for his country or for his immediate community. He's a member of the Library Board of Trustees at Richmond, another institution here in my own heart, and is here tonight representing, uh, as he should probably, the Board of Trustees of the college and whose seats you are sitting, um, immediate past president, of, uh, immediate past chair of the Board of Trustees of the Long Days and College. This is Duke Mitchell. You'll see if you clap at the end of it, then we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, 
But thanks, uh, thanks, Colonel Duke, uh, U.S. Air Force, retired, best Air Force in the world. You'll be encouraged to hear that the Marine Corps now considers the Air Force an ally and force. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Wanda and Elaine, for working through my terrible schedule uh, over all these months so we can make this happen. And Jason, for, uh, for uh, opening the door to Columbia Basin College. You know, it's really a pleasure to come back to your hometown. Uh, and you come back with a degree of humility, especially when there's police officers in the room, uh, knowing that in my younger days, had they not had a sense of humor, uh, I probably would never have seen the career that I had, uh, to put it very bluntly. Uh, because this is the place that formed me. It was the greatest generation that came out of the Depression and World War II. And I probably had no idea how lucky I was when your father was a scoutmaster. That we, we just took it as natural that these, uh, these real men would raise us and turn us into young men who had respect for each other, a fundamental friendliness in the town where I had to leave Richland to learn anything about racism, for example. This town's values armed me for the, the life I ended up leading, something I could never have dreamed of. I was swimming down the Columbia River. Uh, anyway, I came out of Senate of Washington uh, in 1971. I was a 21-year-old second lieutenant. Went off to the Pacific Fleet for most of the next uh, eight years. And in 1979, some of you might remember when Jimmy Carter sent our first Marines and, and naval units, significant units, into the Persian Gulf. And I still remember uh, we, were, we were sweating one day on our gear on helicopters heading back out to the ships. I said, man, I am never coming back to this crazy part of the world. <laughs> you got to be very careful you tell the coming up and bring her what you're not going to do. <laughs> uh, I spent the rest of my adult life basically in the Middle East, studying the Middle East, serving there, fighting there, doing that sort of thing. And it's a region with the extraordinary talent of disappointing any kind of optimism you can have. It's just a maddening area to get to know. And I'm coming here tonight uh, reminded that I didn't serve in the Marine Corps for 40 odd years. I served in the U.S. Marine Corps. That means we are answerable to every one of you in this room for what we did or did not do. And I will tell you right up front that especially to the Vietnam generation of Marines and sailors who raised me, uh, we have a deep sense of gratitude and certainly a sense of guilt for what happened on 9-11. But anyone in the CIA or the military knew we had let you down, but they got through. It never could have happened. And we were, it was personal that we went out after them. Having dealt with these maniacs who uh, thought by hurting us, they could scare us. I dealt with them since 1979. And you do not patronize these guys. They really believe women have no rights. The girls do not go to school. They can tell you how to pray. So I'm on record that it was an absolute pleasure to go back after them for us and try to reverse uh, what had happened where they felt they could attack our country and get away with it. Region. 
So what I thought I would do is speak rather briefly about the cross currents there and then speak long enough that you have something that you can challenge me on or, and then we'll get into your questions. And that's always the best part of a discussion like this. Uh, and, and as always, uh, please take it wherever you want to take it. Um, again, we serve you, those of us who are fortunate enough, and in my case, for 40 odd years, I still pinch myself surprised the Marine Corps let me hang around that long. But we serve you, so let's, let's have nothing, no inhibitions about what we have. I've got a very thick skin. Um, in looking at this region, though, the cross currents, so when you look at the headline each day, it, the cross currents will help you sort it out uh, as far as what's going on and to recognize there are ethnic rivalries. You know of them uh, up in the, uh, I don't think I have a major point up here, do uh, I? Okay, that's okay. If, but we have Turkmen, and you look up there, Turkmenistan or Turkey, uh, up north of the capital and all. And then we've got Persians in Iran. Uh, you've got Arabs, of course. Uh, you've got all sorts of, uh, just a mixing ground there of Kurds and all those folks. And many of them have a very brutal history between each other. And they, they and gentlemen, have forgotten none of their history. They've just got too much history out there. You've also got the religious groups out there, Muslim, Jew, Christian, you've got Druze, of course you've got Coptic Christians down in, in Egypt, and then you've got the Sunni-Shia split between the, the Muslims. Uh, and that's another one, and, and right now uh, you see, for example, Shia from Iran, Persian, who are shaking up as one of the number one threats to an enemy of ours, ISIS. So you're starting to get a sense of how complex this is. Um, and then you've got the Israeli Palestinian problem, where the Palestinian people have no homeland, and the Israelis and the Palestinians cannot come to grips with how they are going to uh, solve the two state solution. And it's the only good solution. Republican and Democratic administrations in Washington have supported this solution. Uh, if anyone's got a better idea, I always talk, I'm eager to hear it. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, the chances for a two-state solution to bring peace on that are going backwards. It probably will not happen. And that's a terrible, irresponsible act by all of us to turn this problem over to the next generation. But I fear it's going to happen. The King of Jordan, who is absolutely respected on all sides by everyone, Things but we're, we're on, the, on the verge of losing the opportunity. Then you've got another cross current of reformers versus authoritarians. You see that playing out in very bloody style in Syria right now, where the authoritarian thought is being fought by reformers who we machine gun, and now the radicals have basically taken over that fight. You've got this geopolitical churn ball of radioactive terrorists churning out in the very heart of the Middle East. You know, I, I, on one occasion, I was very frustrated about this. I was in a London meeting with a former British Prime Minister, and I was expressing some of my frustration, and he just sat back and laughed. He said, Jim, if you can't ride two horses in the Middle East circus, get out of the circus. Uh, so I remembered that. I was going to testify, and even though I said I wouldn't testify anymore in front of the Senate, uh, when I retired, I was back in January. And I reminded them there that you always hear the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Not always. Sometimes the enemy of your enemy is still your enemy. And that's one of the real challenges that you all look at this situation and say, what on earth is America doing still involved with this? something that absolutely uh, complex as this, where many of the protagonists don't even seem to want to why, why are we trying for it? I'm trying to convince you why we're doing it. There is also the violent jihadist terrorists. And there's, remember, there's two brands of these folks. And I want to start, ladies and gentlemen, with the Shia side of it, supported by Iran, because it's probably the bigger threat, even though you hear a lot about the other side, Al-Qaeda and the Sunni. On the Shia side, you have people who declared war on us in 1983. Blew up our embassy in Beirut, blew up the French paratrooper barracks, U.S. Marine peacekeeper barracks, that sort of thing. Uh, they continue to do this sort of this sort of uh, terrorism all over the place. 
just uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, they tried to murder the Saudi ambassador to Washington, D.C., less than two miles from the White House. And but for one mistake, they'd have pulled it off, and they'd have killed hundreds of Americans in the process. I bring this up because the biggest destabilizing influence in this region is Iran. To this day, it is Iran, and there could be no misunderstanding about this uh, as we go forward, for example, on this nuclear framework agreement. The second variety of terrorists, of course, the Sunni, we know them well, unlike Lebanese, Hezbollah, and the Iranian, we know them as Al-Qaeda. They tried to bring down the trade tower, they were successful on 9-11 the second time, blew up USS Cole, which was refueling in a neutral port. I can go on and on, you, you know what they're up to. Their leadership has been shredded up in the Pakistan, Afghan area by the Americans, uh, but at the same time they have franchised out and over here, in, actually over off the map, over this way, you know about Boko Haram in Africa, up in the Libya area, you have Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb. And they have been, uh, they have been very effective in Libya, to turn the country apart. Down here in Somalia, on the Indian Ocean, we've got Al-Shabaab. They've been roughly handled uh, by the African forces. They've been forced out of the city. Our special forces trained the Africans but there's still an existence down there. And Yemen is the most deadly one. Hey, thanks for your great Here in Yemen, uh, which is now under attack uh, by the Saudis, uh, you, you've got out Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. These are the ones who tried to bring down the airliner over Detroit a couple of years ago on Christmas Day. Completely focused as much as they can be under our pressure again, uh, on attacking us. Up here is where you've got the, uh, the shredded senior leadership. Over here you've got al-Nusra and of course ISIS in this area right here. And uh, you just, you, you've just got this thing, it's franchising out. It is stronger today for all of our efforts than it was five years ago or ten years ago. And so as we look at this, we are entering an era, we're going to remain in an era of frequent skirmish. This is not going to be over with in the next year or two, it's simply going to go on. And we're going to have to fight them because if we do not, they will continue to roll against our friends, they will attack us, and it's simply a reality. Uh, and, and declaring them dead or declaring them junior varsity is not sufficient. We're going to have to actually throw them back. In ISIS' case, they you know, have the most capable terrorist group ever. Uh, they hold ground. They have actually removed the border here between Iraq and Syria, the old French and British established border out of the Ottoman Stone in 1918. They've actually removed the bulldozers and they're holding ground. No terrorist group has held ground against us before. It was always a challenge for them. And they would end up paying when they try to Iraq. This thing is still working now. Here we go. Just move on. Drop down. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, they have they are a richer organization. They're holding terrain, and they have a sense, an aura of invincibility. In other words, people say that they're really. Guess what? They are recruiting from the West young men and women uh, at a level that Al Qaeda was never able to do. So this is a deadly group that's going to have to be dealt with, and more of the Americans. Okay, there we go. Um, but basically they're rich, they control ground, 
and they are attracting recruits, and they are vulnerable because of a number of these things. But at the same time, we're going to have to deal with them. Uh, in the midst of all this, the Western democracies, including America, are running. I mean, we have to be honest here and just admit uh, our commander chief of the human setting doesn't have an integrated strategy. And so right now, at, at a, the worst possible time in terms of our fiscal situation, and in terms of our willingness to have political unity, uh, we are confronting this end. And the reality, uh, by and large, the Americans today are just got back from Austria. There's a whole lot of Europeans who are very fearful. They think America has the most polarized electorate in its history. They will not back. They elect people to go to Washington not to compromise. And the result is we're paralyzed. And if the Americans are paralyzed, their fear is there is no leader. No matter what someone says, you cannot lead from the rear, you cannot lead from the middle. You have to lead up front. It's not leading up front. I've been in the Naval Office for 40 years, and I have no politics. I, I loyally serve, say, a cheery aye aye serve to whoever you all uh, select as commander in chief. But, I mean, the reality is that America is needed out there. And I'll get into a little more on this, because it's not to be sent 100,000 troops for 10 years or do nothing. There's got to be a more wise, strategic, nuanced way for how we do this in light of the cost to our families when we to get into a situation like this. So we have been unwilling to keep our fiscal houses in order, and so we're much worse. Okay, here we go again. Okay. This is great. Thanks. We're very patient. But our allies are worried. I just got back from Cairo a short time ago, uh, about three weeks ago. Our allies are very worried, and one of the reasons they're worried is because our enemies are becoming very scornful. Uh, they know that we have the best military in the world, but they're told in advance, we reassure you, we will not send them after you. So when you reassure an enemy in advance, you end up giving them a lot of freedom at that point. And so we need to come to some kind of fundamental unity here within our own country about what it is we stand for. Ladies and gentlemen, even more important is what we absolutely will not tolerate. Now contrast where we're at today with that greatest generation that raised me, you know, up in Richmond and took me to Jason Lee Elementary School and, and gave me a, a life where I was safe and had good teachers, uh, where you learned respect for one another. Uh, you didn't care if it was a teacher or a policeman who said, sir or ma'am. That generation comes home from the worst war in human history. 60, 70 million dead. They can't even figure out how many tens of millions of people died in World War II. And they look around and they said, it's a pretty crummy world. And we're going to do something about it. And the first thing you see is uh, they set up an international order. And the Americans lead on this. We don't dictate, but we lead, we persuade. And we use one of the two powers we have, the power of inspiration, to bring people together. And in that case, they, got, they have the imagination where the people can talk over problems. It built up the strength of the state system so you would actually have a way to stabilize the world. The Marshall Plan. They watched as a vindictive peace treaty after World War I help spawn World War II. It was the whole region. They knew it would help spawn. So they said, what we're going to do is we've just fought a gracious war against the Japanese in the Pacific with no quarter given. We fought against the Nazis and fascism in Europe. And we turn around and that generation in five years, in three years actually, is helping those countries get back on their feet. Think of how magnanimous that is. Further, Ambassador Tim Beasley, the Australian ambassador to Washington, told me once that the Americans made the single most self-sacrificial act in world history in the late 1940s. I was thinking, what is your Marshall Plan? You know, lost a lot of money, but we gained it all back in trade. He said, no, no, no. He said, you could have just turned your back on Europe, on Latin America, Canada, Mexico, and the Pacific. So we are not going to get involved. Russians come across the Soviet Union, Europe, you're on your own this time. Instead, the American leadership, after coming out of that terrible war where there was hundreds of thousands of boys, they turn around and say, we're willing 
They missed 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war under NATO as we band together to protect our values that we hold dear. Now think of that unity and think of that commitment the greatest generation made saying you cannot act like you're an island in this world and you can just ignore the rest of the world. And I think that right now our allies are disappointed and perplexed because we appear to think that international system is self-sustaining. It's not we're going to have to work at it and roll up our sleeves and engage. I was at a conference uh, last week in Austria where there were six prime ministers of European countries. There were numerous ministers of finance and foreign affairs. And there was not one American government official there. There were people that are looking for American leadership. And so at a time when our diminishing fiscal situation and the resultant degradation of our military capability, remember, no nation in history, if it didn't keep its fiscal house in order, kept its military force strong. It's never been in no country in, in history to do it. At a time when we need allies more than ever, we seem to be humiliating them and oftentimes not willing to work with our, our friends of many years and leaving ourselves somewhat in a, in a very difficult position that you can understand. I am even seem to demand perfection from other countries that our own country hasn't reached yet. And then we publicly humiliate them if they are doing something that we disapprove of. And I think that that is a, a very big reason why today in this region we have the least influence we've had in 40 years. And there's no surprise at a time when American influence is going down, like water seeping into all the cracks in our policy on these terrorists who are becoming such a threat and are such a murderous crew out here. And they're not that tough, like you know. They're, they're murderous. They're best against women, children, unarmed people, old men, that sort of thing. The ferocity and the skill and the ethics of our troops in close quarters battle they are not that hard to kill, I'll just tell you that right up front. And I think we have to remember that America does have two fundamental strengths. One is the power of inspiration. I'll give you an example. I'm reading to a guy one night, down on the road, he's got a wheelbarrow, two artillery rounds, the wire, the battery, the detonator, and everything. Put in what I need, you know, whistling out there at night, digging the hole. He looks out and there's five Marines and around with automatic weapons. Not his death you know? <laughs> So uh, I was at the base the next day and he said, hey, General, this guy speaks English, he's an engineer. I said, sure. So I went down and talked to him and I uh, gave him a cup of coffee. He talked like a gay bird, no problem. And, I, and, he's, and he said, I said, why are you doing this? I mean, you're assuming you know the Marines are your best friends out there. Why are you doing this? And he said, oh, you know, you guys are a bunch of troops. I said, knock it off. You're an educated man. Don't, don't give me that. You know, show a little respect for yourself. And he said, well, he said, yeah, he said, I know in my heart I want you gone now, but in my head I know we need you guys. And so he talked for a while, and he said, I guess you can send me down to the rock. I said, oh yeah, you're, you're going to jail. And uh, he said, when I get out, you think I could immigrate from America? <laughs> <laughs> now think of the power of America, that a guy was actually out there fighting us, but in the back of his mind, he would like to immigrate to America. Think what that says about you. Not about me, the military guy, is fighting, but about what the country that you have made that would cut all the way across the racial, ethnic, religious hatred and halfway around the world. The guy would say, I come to America. There's no other, I mean, can you imagine, you know, an American saying that he's been taken prisoner by Nazi Germany? I mean, there's no country in the world that's got the war. So the power of inspiration, and yet we've turned to the power of intimidation so many times in this last 10, 15 years. And we have over-militarized our foreign policy, and we're not using that power of inspiration that is so powerful that you can actually turn people around who are out there, out there fighting us. And I, I bring this up because I think we have to learn how to engage more with the world and intervene militarily, at least with big forces left. That's, I think, the solution to many of our problems. We're going to have to craft a bipartisan uh, strategy, a Republican and Democrat strategy, such as the greatest generation made, called containment of the Soviet Union, until the internal friction rotted them from the inside out. 
Now, a Republican and Democrat administrations administer it differently, but they all agree on the fundamental strategy. And today, we do not have that, and the enemy is cheering every day as we go after our president, after the Congress blocks things, that sort of stuff. We're on. We've got to get back to governing again and, and finding that fundamental friendliness between us where we accept each other as Americans. I, I was talking, I, I'm down at Stanford now, told me face to face, I understand the French and British are calling, I said yes. They said, well, we know about to go back to the Americans to get them more true. You can't find, you can't buy a friend like that. That same trip, I was down in Jordan, and I was seeing the king there, who I've known since he was the crown prince, very good man. And we were talking about his refugee problem up on the Syrian border, we got done with that. And I said, tell me what it's like to be a king. I've never been a king. What, what, what's a king do? And so he, I, he's telling me about it, and then he said, by the way, I've heard the French and British are pulling their troops out. Yeah, they are, you mentioned. He said, well, he said, let me just tell you something right up front. He said, I will have a Jordanian soldier there until the last American soldier comes home. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you never hear stories like that. But believe me, there are countries out there who know that how the Americans go is whether or not they have a chance for a better future as well. And they're willing to put their troops on the line. They're willing to fight alongside us. But they are very, very concerned right now, and the trust is, is a little bit shaky, to say the least. I think that uh, we've got to get better at explaining what it is we're fighting for. I have 19-year-old Lance Corporal who are more articulate in explaining the nobility of this fight than many of the alleged spokesmen in Washington, D.C. And we're going to have to get less apologetic about the value when we say Yes, girls go to school. That's the way it goes. And let me tell you, even eight-year-olds understand this. I was out with one of uh, Captain's uh, old shipmates in a place called Condor right after 9-11. Down in southern Afghanistan, it was the home, the spiritual home of the Taliban. Right up in uh, this area here. And we've taken Condor. The enemy didn't fight much. Uh, they, they're good at popping. They're not good at fighting. And uh, they came to me and said, we want to open the school. I said, of course. You know, I said, well, we want to open the girls' schools. Well, absolutely. Of course we'll open the girls' schools. And you know why they brought that one up? There are still 20,000 Taliban in town, you know, kind of scouting at us all the time. Didn't have the guts to fight it. And they would have imprisoned, beaten, or killed people for teaching girls. But they knew, they feared what education could do to their work way of dealing with the world. And so on the day of it, I, I flooded the town with uh, Navy SEALs, Army Special Forces, and Marines, and they're standing out on the street with their bandoliers of ammo, their grenades, their automatic weapons, just to make real sure that nobody decided to get brave. And it was like God just mixed water with the hydrated little boys and girls, and they came marching out with little white shirts on, drove their little head scarves, and their, the boys with their, uh, their, their long pants, and they're walking right down the street. How many of you would have wanted your kid walking to school alongside foreign soldiers with automatic weapons? And that's how much those people trusted us. And by the way, those eight-year-old boys and girls knew who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. And they walked very proudly by our guys, waving and smiling to them. And I can tell you that uh, sometimes, you know, once in a while, I know we're not the perfect guys and we make mistakes. We are the good guys. And uh, the New York Times still trying to figure it out. The eight-year-old boys and girls in Afghanistan figured it out a long time ago. <laughs> so it was a point here. Representing you and your better angels is what our labs did over there. That we made a very clear statement on just what it was that we stood for. At the same time, I have to say, why do we stay connected? What, what, what is it that keeps us there? I'll give you three quick arguments so we can get to the Q&A here. First is economic. Now, what my real job was out in the Gulf, out in this area, was what was, besides coordinating military activity, was how do you keep peace or what passes for peace? One more year, one more month, one more week, one more day, one more hour, 
So during my time there, Secretary Clinton was a diplomat to try to keep the peace. That was my real job. But I knew that if those straits of Hormuz got closed, we were in deep trouble because the world economy, even if the Americans don't need the oil, all of our markets need it. And if you want to see everything from the blue country to New York City, lose its overseas markets in a hurry, watch it globally traded commodity called oil get shut off by 40% from an hour ago. So I knew I had to keep the straight open. Remember when all those folks over there in Iran were talking about mining the straight? Remember when they were talking about mining all the water? You heard that last two years? No. You know why? I was worried one night flying back to my plane because there people had said we're going to put mine in what I would have done in that case of a young officer was going to dump mine in the water. We're going to have things blown up. We're going to get it shut off. And now we're turning towards war. So I decided I'd run an anti-mine exercise. Not an anti-Iran exercise. That's a very naive marine So we run an anti-mine exercise. And I figured we'd get about a half dozen countries. You know, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, France, Britain, United States. The normal, usual subject. The first time the U.S. Navy ran a fifth fleet, the only Navy that's crust enough to pull this off, we had 29 nations show up from every continent except Antarctica. And I'm looking for a paint one so I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it included Canada, Estonia, it included Singapore, Japan, Djibouti. They were all coming in. And Iran is sitting there watching this international coalition building against them. And it just fooled them off. They realized the more they talked about mining, they were actually going to see more and more countries signing up to keep that oil flowing. That's how your Navy can help keep the peace if we're out there. If we're not there, then who knows what could have happened. And sometimes the best war that ever happened is the one that never happened, that we prevented. So economic reasons, we need to stay connected. The second one is diplomatic. You don't have a friend like the King of Jordan like uh, the United Arab Emirates, you don't stand by them in their time of trouble. If you want them in Afghanistan with you when we need them, when we get attacked out of Afghanistan, you better stand with them when they need us at the same way. So you got to be a friend to somebody if you want them to be a friend to you. And the third force is security. We saw it happen at 9-11 when we decided to just wait until the enemy struck us. You've got to fight them overseas. You've got to fight them in their heartland in order to keep them off balance. But I would just tell you too, ladies and gentlemen, that as you look at this, uh, we have some young people here, uh, and for you, it, it's a very depressing area that you cannot fall back into cynicism, or and you can't fall back into, into any kind of cowardice. Cynicism, no matter how bad a situation is, cynicism never improves, ever. And the military is another form of cowardice because cynicism means you don't have to do anything about it. One of the greatest generation was, uh, was a baseball player named Jackie Robbins. When we were growing up, many of us right here, you know, we wanted to be Jackie Robbins. And that was uh, that sparkly ball player who came home from uh, World War II, a lieutenant in the Army. And he said he wrote his own epitaph. I went to see it in New York City. I went to see it, it was a rainy, cold, windy day in January in Cypress Hill Cemetery. I want to see this thing, I got up there to speak to the United Nations. And so my bodyguards take me out there, and they're taking my life, they're standing there, and the wind's whipping all over them and everything, they think I'm crazy. He wrote his own epitaph, and I think it says, a life is not important except in its impact on other lives. And to the greatest generation, to the veterans, who raised me and, and held the line, and to all of you in this town who brought me up in a way that I could deal with kings and people I couldn't even speak their language, but I could deal with them as equals. I just, I would just tell you that you've made a difference. We've got to keep the faith that we can still make a difference and rediscover that friendliness between all of us here, but we don't classify each other in one category or another and say I won't listen to that. We need to listen to each other, respect each other, be open to each other. And I used to tell my officers, I don't want you willing just to listen to the foreign country's officers. I had 60 names on my staff at Centon. I want you willing to be persuaded by other people, an open mind. And I think that's really the, 
way we're going to find our way through this. Because I have to be open to other people's ideas for how we can band together. We need a very strong coalition if we're going to deal with these enemies. Let me stop there, and now we're going to do whatever you want to do. You can talk about that now, or you can talk about something else. It's completely up to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, General, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, in talking about the parish, you mentioned the word franchising. Uh, can you tell us, uh, did all of us start with one group and sort of morph into these other groups? Uh, and the second question is, I wonder if you have any comment on the uh, terror, uh, the uh, hostage uh, policy that was uh, yeah. mentioned. Okay, on, on where did this come from? Uh, one point I make, ladies and gentlemen, it did not start with the creation of modern state of Israel. It did not start with sight of people. It did not start with 9-11 or the American invasion of Iraq. This thing going on for a while. I went back and looked it up in the American presidential paper. The first time I could find Jihad, which president wrote about it? Jefferson. And for you Marines in the audience, the short of the AAA, that's when you got that line. Okay? So this did not start recently. And out of some rather fundamentalist strains due to uh, a lack of good governance where they feel like the whole world's going wrong, people resorted to some very fundamental views of the Muslim religion. On the Shia side it happened, on the Saudi, uh, the, the Sunni side, uh, it came out of the Riyadh desert that we call a Baha'i. And that it, they are very fundamental strains. And out of that comes these, these different strains. Uh, they do not all come from one point of view. They come from what I would call a, uh, almost a, a um, kind of a, let's go back to the good old days but on steroids. In other words, we shouldn't have lights, and we, we shouldn't have any kind of progress and this sort of thing. And so we have to deal with that, the way the ball, the way the ball lies. You're just going to have to marry your time and accept it. But the way to deal with it is to ask the fundamental community question, for example, is political Islam in our best interest? We're not even asking the question. Political Islam is what the Muslim brother did in Cairo for a year before the Egyptian people had a public impeachment and threw them out of 20 million people in the street, the largest mass gatherings in human history. Or is the Shia side of political Islam, which was the Mullahs there in uh, Tehran are doing. And you start by asking those questions and then you construct an understanding uh, answer to your, your question here. So, um, what was your second question about? The, uh, the, the, the change in the policy on the hostage. Yeah, that's a very tough one. How many of us, if we had a family member held hostage, would not want to do everything possible to get them out of their hands? And the president is in a very difficult position, and he freely admitted as a parent he would do anything he could for his family member, but as president, he has responsibility as commander-in-chief. So all they did, as I understand it, you know, is decriminalize if a family raises money. The challenge is, of course, as soon as you engage in this, then the dollar signs go up in their eyes and say, well, let's go find another American who got money back. So it, it is heartbreaking because how, how do you tell a family, don't try to get your loved one out? And yet, as a government policy, you really want to jeopardize all the other American tourists medical people going in to help in a crisis situation and make them part. It is a very tough thing, and this is where you know, those of you who have religious faith pray for the president and he tries to deal with them. I don't want to deal with it. I mean, how do you look at the parent guy and say, your kid's life isn't worth it? I can't do it. I don't have it in me. So he's got a very tough situation, and I, I, I guess he did it not the only thing he could do as a human being. But this just shows the time if you get to that level, you have no good option. You have only the least bad option. That's where we've got to find some compassion for the people of the top <coughs> without losing our, our sense of who we are and recommending what we think is right. And I'll tell you, the military has been, uh, we've always tried to get our people back. We've had an earned to do it, but we understood the policy and it just gave us impetus to try to, try to recover the best answer I can give you to not Sir, your candor is refreshing and inspiring. 
Will you run for president? <laughs> No. I, 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 one thing, I've had a rather colorful life and I've said some things I've heard that I've never took one bad boy, not once. I never apologized for him either. And, uh, and I won't. I like the enemy knowing what a few guys like me around. Uh, but uh, now, what we need to do is we all need to roll up our shirt sleeves, guys and gals, and we all need to work together on this and organize it bring our ideas forward in non-adversarial ways and try to have strategic level conversations that are historically informed and recognize we have no moral obligation to try to do the impossible. And just because some country has got a bad guy that you know, we can't keep going around sending our boys in to clean it up. Will Rogers back in 1920 said something interesting. We've been sending troops, Marines mostly, into the, the uh, Central America, what's called the Banana Wars. And Will Rogers said it may surprise some Americans to know that most people prefer an imperfect government of their own choosing over a perfect one forced on them by the bad of the U.S. Marines. As Americans, that, we've been to stand it implicitly. But at the same time, sometimes there's just bad people out there and I think that's where, by working with other countries, not humbling them, not humiliating them, but working with them, we can find a way forward, and that's what we have to do. And, and someone like me, I was, I was very myopic for, for 40 years. Good guys, bad guys, take these guys, beat up those guys. You need someone with a broader perspective, I think. <laughs> oh, go ahead. General, first of all, thank you for your service. Yeah, I'm Jim now. I've rejoined the human race. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> long, 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 Sir, you're, you're, you're always general. Thank, thank you. you. Getting back to Afghanistan, whatever happened to the Northern Alliance? We used to hear a lot about them, but I'm not sure what they were and how they, how they fit in now. Yeah, the Northern Alliance uh, was part of the anti-Soviet uh, fight. It was under a guy named Massoud. Uh, uh, 24 hours before they hit New York City and Washington, D.C., they assassinated Massoud using a fake TV camera crew that had the bomb inside the, uh, the camera. And they're Tajiks. They're up north. They're not Pashtun. They're up north in the Tangier Valley and that part of Afghanistan. And they were the first guys that Jawbreaker and the rest of the CIA and Special Force went in from the north with. I went in from the south as Task Force 58, and we worked mostly with the Hopkins. But they, uh, you find a lot of them in the Afghan army now. They've been incorporated there, but there's still a lot of uh, what I call regionalism, warlords, and that sort of thing. And they're, the Tajiks are still there. Uh, it's not a well-penetrated area by the Taliban because they, they get kicked around pretty rough by the country. So they're still out there. They're just not called the Northern Alliance anymore as we try to keep that country together. So what's called the Tokyo Donors Crew, about 70 nations contributed the money to try to keep the country together. The money comes to the now via the central government to try to take some degree of money self-interest. But yeah, they're, they're good guys. You find a lot of them in their Afghan army. Sir, over this uh, sir, what is the long-term game here, especially with respect to that blue spot up there, Iran? Those people have been there for 5,000 years, and I'm pretty sure they probably feel they should be the dominant power. So how do we deal this? And I'm talking multi-decade. What's the strategy here for uh, influencing them or constraining them? Yeah, I, there's not a good strategy right now. I'm not saying it's a surprise to you. I mean, you, you've heard our commander in chief about ISIS. And we do not have an integrated regional strategy, so we keep shooting behind the duck. Those of you who go hunting down here, Mary Pond, keep shooting behind the duck and clapping by her. And you deal with each incident as one off. And the result is you can actually solve one problem and create the next problem or a worse problem. So we've got to come up with an understanding of 
what is our policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis the Sunnis, vis-a-vis -vis the Shia. And we've got to sit down and say, and quit whining to ourselves. It was very complex. I think uh, post-World War II was pretty complex as well. And certainly post-Napoleonic Europe was very easy to deal with. The whole world turned upside down. So we've got to start with a policy. And then you create a strategy. And a strategy is very simple. In Atlantic Magazine, July of 2013, President Emeritus of Dartmouth University wrote an article, What Did We Learn From the Korean War? And how did we go into the Korean War, Vietnam War, Iraq, Afghanistan, and we get into these wars and we don't know how to end them? What is, why is it? And he says, if you have merchant political end states, then you don't know how to end the war. Now, I notice I left one more out that it's storm. President Bush said, we're going to throw that out there. He brought in overwhelming force. He let the UN do it. He created a coalition. I think the only uh, four countries not with us were Cuba, Yemen, Jordan, and someone else, North Korea. I mean, we, we got, you know, we, bought, we paid no money for that war. Everyone else was paying for it. We went in, we kicked it, and then there was a left march on Baghdad. We said, no, no mission creep. We said we freed Kuwait, we did it, we're coming home. And so that shows that we look at Abraham Lincoln. He said we're going to save the Union. After the kind of victory at Antietam, he said, I can't save the Union and have it half slave and half free. He changed the political, but it was still a clear political instinct. So we've got to get back to that kind of thinking. And the way I would look at it here is, number one, there's political Islam in our best interest. That's one of the countries with it, run by it. And if it's not, are we supporting pulling together a coalition of willing allies to work together to subordinate our individual concerns and support the countervailing forces? For example, in Egypt right now, President al-Sisi came out on January 1st, he went out to Al-Azhar University, the most famous university in all of Arab lands, and all the, uh, the clerics were there from the Sunni side. He ripped them apart. He said, you are enlisting the hatred of the entire world against our, our religion. It's not our religious problem. It's your political talk that's making everyone fear us and hate us. And you've got to have a revolution in your rhetoric. So there's something we can stand by. Unfortunately, we've had on again, off again, and we kind of, nobody knows we're going to stand with Egypt. So we've got to support the countervailing forces, and they're not going to be perfect. I will tell you right now, I have stuck peacefully among murderers to defend this country. And it's simply a reality if we balance our idealism with our pragmatism. So that's the way I would approach the problem. And you made very, the two words I would put together are um, containment and engagement, congagement. Contain Iran and engage with Iran. I know what the president tried to do. It was the right thing to try to do. But at the same time, if you come up with the wrong nuclear framework here, you can actually incite three other countries. You all know who they are. Turkey, Egypt, and, and one other, Saudi, uh, to actually have nuclear weapons. Now, you want arms control agreements to limit proliferation. This one could expand. So you've got to go back to strategic questions and sort it out there and then move forward with it. Your question is absolutely valid. Let's switch over to this subject. Do you have any strategic thoughts on what's going on with the Ukraine and Russia, how Europe is interacting? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting, ladies and gentlemen. I tried to figure out what it is that's similar between Putin and Ukraine, ISIS and Middle East, and China and the South China Sea. And what it is is an attack on the state system that after World War II we said that the UN were going to use the state system to keep stability. Putin wants unstable countries on its periphery because those are not as much of a threat to the democracy that might inspire some discontent in Moscow. So he wants a veto authority over the military, economic, and diplomatic actions by Ukraine. The Chinese told a friend of mine that Putin Ukraine lost Crimea. <coughs> Russia. Putin lost Ukraine as a market. I mean, they hate him right now. Mm -hmm. NATO 
lost Putin in Russia as a partner. We had we started partnering with them after the Berlin Wall came down. And the world lost stability. That's kind of the view of what's going on there. Go down to the Middle East and you see where the Taliban is actually removing the border. They're removing the state system again. Go to China and the South China Sea and they want to veto authority over all the periphery states. Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Taiwan. They want to veto authority in their area as well. I think they don't use their military like Russia does. They'll use tribute model. Go to classical China, you pay obedience, you pay respect. And so the, the, the common theme among all of them is that they're taking on the state model. And in Putin's case, he goes to bed every night pretty comfortable that he can break every rule and the left will try to obey all the rules. But NATO is starting to I met with the NATO Secretary General in Austria last week, and NATO is taking steps. It's slow, it's cumbersome. I was a Supreme Allied Commander for NATO's transformation. That is, NATO will get to 28 nations alliance, very powerful. And here's Sweden and Finland, not part of NATO, starting to listen very acutely to what NATO's up to. So Putin is creating for Russia a disaster. And that's not good either. And if Russia falls apart, we're going to have a lot of loose nukes and other problems. So it's, it's a very, very dangerous situation. And worse than the number of ICBMs he's talking about, building, it is rhetoric about America being turned into radioactive bath, using nukes on Danish warships. I mean, he's he really a nut case, you know? So, uh, yeah, aside from that, I don't think it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but go all the way over the side of it. Uh, General, there's a, as a head army officer, one of the things that I've been concerned about in the last few years. So I'm going to ask the question of Mark. Um, in the last few years, there's been a, a movement of senior military officers being uh, pulled out, pushed out. Um, so I'm going to ask the question. Get out. Uh, they got away with the troops, though, is what we're worried about. And 
there right now at Holding Strong, the military center in charge is still in the game. Yes, sir. General, General Clark, you could uh, comment on the Kurds. Yeah. The Kurds are some of the best fighters in the world, and there's been criticism. We haven't armed them like we should. Yeah. And I'll get you back to your cross currents because mm -hmm. coming on the Turks and the Kurds and yeah. that clash. Yeah, up in northern Iraq, the Kurds, and they, they're also in northwestern Iran. They're also in Turkey and in Syria. And so the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, what you've got are uh, a group that has been beleaguered, that are probably the largest uh, ethnic group that does not have their own country in the world. And every time they look like they're going to get a country, the Iranian squadron or Saddam would or the Turks would. And I think right now the best they can hope for is some kind of federated position. But what we're trying to do is create common interest where they get enough of the oil money from Baghdad that they have a reason to stay connected to Baghdad because we don't believe that they'll ever be able to get the Kurdish populations from Iran and Turkey together. And Turkey, it looked like they were starting to say, yeah, it's okay if they have their own country. I don't think they'd buy it anymore. There's just too much uh, upset in the region right now. So what do we do? We need to make certain they get the weapons because they will fight. I've, had the, I've fought alongside the Petrimers and they will fight, no doubt about it. They don't only have the training and that sort of thing, but they have the will to fight, which is the important thing in ground combat. Um, but we're going to have to find a way to do it, but we don't solve that problem and create another problem. So we, it, it, that's why we need an integrated strategy that takes that into account. And then we persuasively bring it to them. And we've got other countries, Germany, France, that will bring weapons into them. They don't all have to come out of the American tax area. We need to lead the way to actually solve this very, very nuanced problem. That's address your question? Or, no, that's good. Thank uh, you. Yes, over there. General, um, Troy was the uh, first great example of uh, a power that learned to destroy from within rather than attacking the uh, gates. Uh, you brought up the fact that our Commander-in-Chief has uh, offended our allies and rewarded our previous uh, adversaries. Uh, we have seen the uh, military forces systematically <laughs> purposely uh, reduced, not only in leadership, but I believe that our Navy is now at a level of them. We have fewer attack craft now than we did in World War II, yeah, before World War II. Uh, it isn't just a geopolitical situation, it's the fact that uh, we seem to have an administration that is purposely bringing the military to a weakened state in regard of geopolitical reality. My question to you is not to uh, responding about that. You cited the fact that the Shiites and the Sunnis have been at each other's throats for over a thousand years and will probably continue to do so. But they are now, of course, getting better technology, including nuclear power. It has been no secret that Saudi Arabia is working right now with various other countries as far as acquiring nuclear power, nuclear uh, delivery systems. So how uh, the employer, it was so dumb, so impossible to use. So the problem starts at home, and then it has to bring in the, the senior statesmen and stateswomen who are willing to deal with this very difficult problem. But right now, we're in a lot of disarray at home, and we're going to have to start sending people to Washington who are told, you will govern, you will compromise, you're not the font of all wisdom, even if I say you're there to represent me, I want this country running again. And so that's the way I think we break out. It's kind of a generalist ad answer, but I, I, I think it is why I don't run, young lady, because I don't, I don't have that. We'll take the submariner over here. Now, two-part question. Can you tell us what ISIS is and what do you think it's going to be a long-term What ISIS is? Yeah. I mean, where do they come from? Who are they? Okay, they come from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We, did, we decimated Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, with, with the surge that President Bush sent in. Uh, they were down to, they might do an attack every 45 to 60 days, and we whack them good. 
in a very young period. We were not losing people in Iraq. We were in a post-combat, pre-reconciliation phase. I studied South Africa and Northern Ireland, and I knew it was going to take a while, and we pulled all our troops out prematurely, and that allowed Al-Qaeda in Iraq to morph into ISIS. They changed their name to Dr. Zarrock then. It was on the stage, okay? And they allowed them to morph, and many of their officers are the Sunni officers from the Iraqi army that we uh, unfortunately uh, disbanded in 2004 after the, or late 2000, uh, 2003 after the invasion. So that's where they come from, but they are a uniquely capable, they are, it's like having Lebanese Hezbollah and Lebanon, Shia group, and to Iran, and Al-Qaeda, and on steroids, mixing those two. So, I mean, they, they're, they're deadly, and, uh, and we're going to have to deal with it. Doesn't mean we have to put 100,000 troops in, but we probably got to put some U.S. troops in to show you have skin in the game and we're willing to commit. Yes, sir. Please. Going back to the question of the Kurds, what do you think about the possibility of a three-state solution in Iraq? Or a three-state division? Yeah, you know, there's, there's talk about in Iraq, if you look at it up there, down there where you see Baghdad down in the southeastern corner, and on up to Baghdad, that's the Shia area. If you go from Baghdad, uh, right in the middle, and go all the way out towards the, the western border there with Syria, that's the Sunni area, the Sunni triangle, if you remember the most vicious part of the uh, of the fight. And then if you go up north where you see the word Iraq, that's where the Kurds are. Uh, now it's not quite that clean, there's a lot of mixing together. But so why don't we break it into three? Number one, that won't solve many, any of the problems that I can see. It, it, won't, it won't do it. Number two, uh, they are probably not economically viable in each case. Specifically, the Sunni area probably is not. So if you can get the carbon tax profits sent to Kurdistan and the Sunni stand and Shia area, then they have a reason to stay together and you, and you can keep the country together. And actually, under Saddam's, Shia and Sunni intermarried went to the university together. Uh, this is a re more recent win coming through them, and you took the totalitarian off of that. There's a lesson here, ladies and gentlemen. You and I don't like totalitarians shooting portrait of people. But guess what? If you don't have a reasonable prospect, and you're going to stay the course and have a better outcome at the end. Don't enter into this thing because you now own it. And that therein lies the problem. We took that, that totalitarian off the top and uncorked all these thousands of years of, uh, of hatred. So that's why you've got to make certain that times just have grim decision making. Just say, I'm sorry that there are people being tortured to death, but I can't send American boys over to do it again. They're just, we have, again, no moral obligation to do the impossible. We've got to find our self-interest and use that to guide them, I think, into a more productive state. But, uh, boy, those are easy words to say, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great question. <laughs> Things to do, though. Yeah. General, retired Air Force guy that spent some quality time at PSAD and uh, a few other garden slots. <laughs> I'm just curious about your thoughts. I know that the Saudis are, I understand, are building a wall on their northern border, which yeah. uh, seems as comical as the German freeways to me. But the, the real question is do you think that ISIS, for uh, emotional impact reasons or any other stupidity, might actually want to try to come down into? Saudi and yeah. Okay. They're already on the way. Okay. Uh, the uh, prince who's in charge of Prince Mohammed bin Ayat, he's about 58 years old. Uh, he is very capable of fighting them. He's vigorous. Uh, he's compassionate. He, he actually uses what you and I would call a five-star hotel with a wall around it. When they capture these guys, they put them inside. Their family visit them. He has clerics who say. You are screwed up in the head. There ain't 72 virgins waiting for you, buddy. You know, this sort of thing. So they they know they're under attack. It's actually Al Qaeda's attack. If you look at Yemen, let me get my pointer here for a minute, because this is kind of interesting. We uh, we were looking at the way they were attacking in young Yemen. We can 
constructed the campaign against them. <clears throat> and we saw there were two like areas that they were, the Al Qaeda was putting together, and they were both pointed like daggers right into the kingdom. And if you go back to the Queen of Sheba uh, in Merah, you're looking at the old Queen of Sheba's trade routes going right in, and their target of Al Qaeda is Saudi Arabia, and that includes ISIS loud and clear. So that's going right by where we were flying U2s out of the bottom. So, I don't know anything about it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but just a quick I got some big story for going to the grave. <laughs> well, I just to tell you, I was surprised to see monkeys in the southern south. Yeah. Uh, they're there. Yeah. Uh, most people don't realize that's pretty drop. The, uh, the follow-up question, we've got about 18 months until we see another president. Do you think that anybody in the Middle East is looking to capitalize on that timeline one way or the other? Oh, yes. Uh, they, they are on the move. They are hoping that we'll have the cracks in our policy stay there. And they're, they're taking advantage of it right now. Uh, in Europe, where I was last week, they think that that's what we're doing. Uh, so there's a sense. One thing we're going to have to do, I, let me just go back to the Middle East, we're going to have to make certain that ISIS image of, of, uh, of primacy, of victory, gets removed, or they're going to continue to attract money, recruits, and that sort of thing. So uh, we're going to have to try and, and up the game there. And if you notice, uh, Michelle Flournoy and, uh, and Senator McCain, old military assistant there at the Senate, you know, the Republican and Democrat, uh, wrote an article yesterday about having to increase what we're doing there. And I think this shows the Hillary Clinton side of the Democrat Party realizes they're going to inherit a mess if they get elected, if they don't do something this administration doesn't do some of what you're talking about. And of course, the Republicans, Lindsey Graham and others, have been very direct about what they think. And so you're seeing a little bit of a confluence, I think, of interest, Republican and Democrat, in regard to this very, very telling threat that, that they believe, I think they answer your question, that absolutely uh, this enemy is oozing into the cracks in our policy. And again, it doesn't mean we have to send 100,000 troops in there. It may be in some of the places we, we fund to have a thousand boys and girls every year come to Richland and London and, and Wichita and go to school in our country and get a different image of the world. There's a hundred ways for us to use our power. It doesn't all have to be U.S. troops on the ground. You can even drop the old two pack from the Northern Afghanistan. I see seven feet. Yeah. You don't know anything about that either. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we we drop little kids you know that candy we have more little kids to eat out of the baby teeth. I have a comment and a question. My comment it just kills me to see the newsreels with ISIS driving all our Humvees and trucks and I go, bomb all that stuff so they won't have mobility. Yeah. The um, the question is, what about poor little Israel? Do you have Anything to say about that? Yeah, first of all, on, on all the trucks and the American juries in ISIS hands, you know, the whole point would be with Arnold, we train them and you bring them in and, and keep them together long enough to learn, you know, their officers treat the troops like just terribly and all and try to create this army. Uh, and we left uh, abruptly and Maliki came in and we moved. All the Sunni, we moved even Shia officers who were good, put in hats, who uh, sold their troops rations. Uh, they, they didn't even go to their units. I mean, they, man, they, they, they weren't even there. They, their, their units would never know them. And it's just a reminder if you can't create something like this out of the whole plot, go back and read what the French officers thought, uh, including Lafayette, when they got here and realized that these guys, these Americans, are going to fight the Redcoats. You got a mess in come. You guys can fight. Well, they learned how to train us, and eventually we were able to stand and fight. You know, whether it be at Yorktown or Saratoga, but it was it's, it's a difficult, long-term commitment. Now, um, as far as Israel goes, uh, there's a very close connection between the Israeli Defense Forces and the U.S. military. I think you're all aware of that. We've known each other. We grew up with young officers together. They go to our schools. Uh, quiet ways, there's times when we have fought alongside each other. And in Israel, we're a democracy. 
So they're, they're raucous and they're, they're full of disagreement and all those kind of things. But right now, the Israelis have the fragmenting going on as well. And they are creating settlements. I was in Bethlehem here a little while ago. And if you sit in Bethlehem, LaSalle, where the LaSalle brothers out of Boston, the Catholic brothers out of Boston, New York, run Bethlehem University for the Palestinian kids. By the way, 85% of the class is female because the boys are too proud to go to school, which is a disaster in the making. If you stand there at Bethlehem University and look around, you see stars of David in these settlements all the way around. And so I met with some of the students, all girls, and they were telling me what it was like to try to go to school each day. In order to get from their village there to this school here, they had to go here, then they had to go down here, they had to go around the cell here, and then they get broke when they go through checkpoints and all. It's not a good situation. And my, my point was, and I testified to this effect, so I'm not saying anything radical here, uh, the settlements are injurious to a two-state solution. Because pretty soon, if, for example, they knew if I'm Jerusalem, and I put a settlement out here of 700 Jewish settlers, and in here are 10,000 Arabs. If I include that inside Israel, then it's no longer a Jewish state, or these guys don't get to vote. Now, there is no, that, you and I know that is a part of it. And, and so they can't go there. And so Israel is taking some decisions that's going to make it very difficult for their kids to have a secure future. Because the Palestinians don't have a state. Now, and and uh, I, I don't know how you solve this. Uh, Secretary Kerry went into office determined to solve this thing. President Clinton got within one inch and Yasser Arafat tore up the agreement and he, he had it. But he realized he would lose power then, so he, he let his people down. Kerry went in, tried it, and uh, one of the Palestinian girls there told me, we know your project, your government aren't really in it. This is just Secretary Kerry, it'll never work. Unfortunately, 19 years old, she was right. Um, so you can't do something for people if the protagonists don't want to do it on either side. And so it's just a, it's just a maddening situation. But Israel's in a very tough situation. And they are still our friend, they are still our ally. We've got a very rocky relationship between their prime minister who has shown disrespect to our president, probably vice versa. You know, and that's just a reminder at the highest levels of government, but I learned that personal relations is what makes it work or not work. Right. Believe it or not, it's not, it, it, it's the same thing that you and I experienced here, uh, Phil trying to run Richmond when you were the mayor. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing unique about it. Things like this happen at the speed of trust, and you build trust. I mean, you have, I, I get to read President Reagan's letters to Gorbachev. Two men trying to reduce nuclear weapons, and they take out two-thirds of all the nuclear weapons in the world. Two men who trusted each other, uh, coming from opposite. You know what Reagan thought about communists, you know what Gorbachev thought about America, and yet they did it. And it just shows the role of trust between men, trust but verify. If I ran, I would change it to distrust, to verify. Uh, but the bottom line is, we can do this. We need some of the young people in this room to come up unburdened with all the kind of the negative lessons that I've learned over the years and try one more time to help Israel through this. Yeah. The dream line, the
actually change it into A airplane sitting somewhere south and fly it back. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I think it would have surfaced by now. Um, we've got a lot of spies and a lot of that. You know, <laughs> that. I was never surprised once for years to stand up there. Not a single time. Not the fall of the mark, not the life of ISIS, no matter what kind of people say. Uh, we have the best spies. So, and I, I'll just tell you, I think the thing's somewhere in the bottom of the ocean. But I don't know, I don't know any more about it than you all know. So. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, North Korea. Um, I not chase that guy. Um, it, I think it's a big threat. I don't know they could reach Los Angeles or Seattle with one of their weapons. And I think you're aware we have certain uh, <coughs> systems between our U.S. Navy and some others that are very focused on this. But, and when you're talking about hitting a missile with a missile, that is technologically at the very top end of the, of the entire game. You cannot chase a missile. You must intercept it. So our focus right now is how do you keep things from breaking out. He will do things. He will kill more people. It'll be South Korean sailors, which he's done. Uh, he'll, he'll do more stuff. And uh, it's, just, it's just something where you don't solve the problem, man. You just can't. You just, that's all you can do. But he is definitely a threat. Boy, if you go over to Tokyo, you'll hear just how much of a threat he's seen as by the, the Japanese leadership. It's a big, big problem. Let's see. Yeah, I'll give you a just a minute. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm uh, studying cybersecurity here at CBC, and so taking it a little more into the future context. So, uh, nuclear, we're talking about, we're talking boots on the ground, but you have cyber terrorists that are starting to learn there in the Middle East, and so they're trying to attack us, our critical infrastructures here in the U.S. And I know that a lot of places here locally in the Tri Cities, we got a lot of smart people working against that. And I know the military and other places are working against that as well, uh, government. But um, I also know that in 2010, the uh, Department of Defense did say that they could consider a cyber attack against the U.S. as being an act of war. So about how far do you think that would take it before we put boots on the ground in one of these countries for attacking us uh, electronically? The cyber attack is a big one. Uh, and this goes back to the need for an integrated strategy where we also consider that. We've looked at what kind of, you need a kind of a theory of war on anything that you do. And, and I went back and studied nuclear war theory, where mutual assurance, right? you wet for us, we wet for you. It doesn't work, by the way. It, 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 it takes more subtlety. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I worked out in Silicon Valley now. And one point they make is you just keep moving your defenses, keep building defenses to slow down people so you can spot them, and then you create a new firewall to stop that. In other words, it's a very dynamic, it's not like, ah, we built it, now we're done. No, because they can always find their way in. But I think that DOD would not be the decider on that. It would have to be a political decision that the damage was severe enough. Uh, for but, but you're absolutely right to bring it up. Iran, for example, has five threats. There's the latent nuclear threat we're addressing. There's the counter-maritime threat, like the mines and all that I mentioned earlier. There's the ballistic missile threat, which is, which is a significant one. There's the cyber threat. And they are now like children juggling with light bulbs filled with nitroglycerin. How, how bad is They don't even realize they're going to turn off the lights in Paris or turn off the London Stock Exchange one of these times. And then you've got this terrorist threat that they, they fight. If when you address them, you only talk about one of those threats, you're giving them a buy on the other. So you have to have an integrated strategy, and it starts with people like you who have a technical understanding of the difficulty advising political leadership who will never have the same level of, of expertise because you know, you're, they don't have the time to study it, and then you've got to integrate this thing. But it won't be a DOD decision, and if they turn off the lights in Madison, Wisconsin or something, you can expect that the U.S. military has plans to deal with these things. And 
but then it's up you know, we give option to the commander in chief. We have both cyber and and, and uh, I suppose. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. General, uh, you cite the fact that the Pentagon is always formulating options and plans, regardless of what the commander in chief states that we don't have any formulated plans for uh, ISIS. Um, well, you know, we correct it. the strategy is something else. We can always have a tactical plan. I'll give you an example. We have a good operational and tactical plan to invade and take down the and take out Saddam. But we do not have a strategy to what do you do in the political end state. So, yeah, the, the, the Department of Defense knows how to run operations. You have to have a strategy guiding you where you're going to really, uh, you're, you're going to perhaps reach something you didn't intend. Uh, we pulled a statue down one time and we thought, now what do we do? Tom was there. You cited that North Korea is run by questionable lunatic. There are certain polos in the Rams who are equally challenged. Yeah. What happens when we wake up one morning and Tel uh, Aviv has been hit with a nuclear device? Well, uh, Israel is not, if Tel Aviv is hit with a nuclear device, um, their military has reassured me that they are not there as superintendent of the Holocaust. Um, so they will do what they think they have to do. Identifying who did it will be the only challenge. And that is a it is a challenge that it can be done. There are technical means, some of which are known here and done out there out of person, but we will be able to identify who did it. Um, but remember this about Iran. You're thinking of them as a country, right? You don't think of them as a country, they're not a country. It's a revolutionary cause that they gain their power by not being a country and acting in their people's best interest. They gain it by being a revolution and they need enemies in order to keep the revolution going and hold the power. And you saw what they did to the Green Movement when they came out. And the boys and girls were beaten, they were thrown in jail, they were thrown raped, they were Bloody awful. By the way, the colonel who led most of that, a guy named Hunter Dye, the promoted the brigadier, the been in Damascus for three years, he's the reason Assad is going to power because of Iran's full support after Russia's regrettable veto of the UN action against Assad. Uh, so it's, uh, it's all tied together there, okay? Yes, ma'am. What's your thoughts on Benghazi and all the fiasco after that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, man, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I, I had sent Tom, I had a quarter million troops, okay, and basically I had to tell the Secretary of Defense, my boss, what I'm doing, but I can move him anywhere I want. And during the three weeks prior to Benghazi, over here in Pakistan, in Islamabad, our SSD was pressed by being demonstrated against the pornographic movie made about the problem. Uh, we called the, the police, got scared, they started running, we called the Military, our master called over a set time. We called the military. The military ran soldiers down, guarded our embassy, and, and it turned out okay. The police came back. They left the military there. The embassy was taken care of. About um, a week later, there were more demonstrations down here at Sanaa, and our ambassador, Cool Hand, looked one about five six. He's a Cool Hand look. I love this guy. I call him once. I say, Beth, I hear you're getting ordered. And all the fellows down there, the mortar round were at least three football fields away from me. It's no problem at all. <laughs> they called me one day and said, I got some worries here. I don't like what I'm seeing out on the street. I said, okay, I'm going to send a couple of Navy airplanes in, have all your vehicles from the embassy down there. There'll be some guys get off the big with very short hair, some very big boxes. And I get them down to the embassy. They got them down there two days later. Crowds demonstrating against the pornographic movie started from over the wall. The Marines shot the first two dead, restored courtesy, everything stable. I leave the extra hundred Marines there for another month or two. Dan Patterson, our ambassador in uh, Egypt, uh, gets uh, the same kind of treatment. He says that Gaza moved again. We've got six guys inside the embassy wall, the police ran away, we got Egyptian military down there, the Marine Guard got them in a chicken wing, put them back outside the gate. Okay, three days later, 
Here I am reporting this to Washington time after time after time. Three days later, the Joint Staff gets a call, same sort of thing. Now it's Captain Command. You notice this line here? I didn't own Libya. Never thank God. And Ambassador Chris is a wonderful guy. He's doing well. He was a risk taker. He's a good diplomat. He didn't just sit around sipping tea at garden parties. He was always out in the field wearing his suit, his boots, and he took a lot of risks. Iraq, we were always worried about it, and we always pulled it off. And he beat with you, he was very effective, he was very persuasive. And he got there, and he asked for more reinforcements for Benghazi. Um, the night it happened, and he gets turned down by someone who handled that the State Department, the Marine Security Guard of the State Department, along with the Secretary of State. We take him from the Marine Corps train, put him in the Secretary of State's battalion, and he or she has them. Now they got someone two levels below who sent them here, so now we need more here, more from him there. They turned him down. They said, don't open the conflict and then God is too dangerous. So they turned him down. That person, by the way, had been fired for, for failing to do it. Chris was dead an hour and 15 minutes after the attack started. There was no way we would have taken it. It just was time. So I don't know the issue because it wasn't in my area, but I wonder how much my constant phone calls Condition them to think this is probably the same old mess going on. And then, frankly, the administration, I don't think, handled well as far as coming out and answering the question either. And so, pretty soon, in conspiracy late in America, people start believing basically anything. I'm not taking any position on it because I don't know the issue, but I wonder how much I conditioned them to think it was a movie again. Of a each time and a crisis that I brought the three weeks, two weeks, three days before. And there's Chris out there taking a chance to get a wonderful, brilliant young diplomat. He'd have been Secretary of State one day. He was just wonderful. So that's the best I can tell you. Bill, you had another question? Just to get a little bit closer to home, uh, do you have any thoughts on the VA, uh, the medical situation, yeah. and then the uh, uh, <coughs> of uh, suicide? Well, on the suicide, I do not understand it. Um, you know, when you come home from something like that, me, every day is a bonus. I mean, I, I'm so happy because uh, comes to understand just how much of a bonus it is to get those days. And how you can, I mean, I tell these guys, you got to live for the gold star parents whose boy didn't come home. So I don't understand. Now on the VA, what I did after hearing all the complaints about it, I, I, was, I, I went in and joined the VA when I came out to the military health care system. I'm not signed up in it. I do it all through Fort Wayne right over here, wall to wall. And I'll tell you, um, I often get phone calls from young sailors, soldiers, Marines mostly, who've been severely wounded and they're having trouble. And they, they, they've heard of me, so they call me. The only time I use my rank, and I'll call the VA, and after you get through the bureaucracy, you'll find some doctor or nurse, and they will move to heaven or earth in order to take care of that guy. It is unbelievable. But getting through the bureaucracy at times, I think, is very difficult. But the care itself, and I've been to many VA hospitals visiting wounded, the care itself in some places like in, down in uh, Tampa, Civilian doctors come there to train because it's the cutting edge of polytrauma, of multiple trauma. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, they come to Palo Alto, VA, and, and Richmond, Virginia, because it's the best traumatic brain injury doctors in the world. And so it, I know there's bureaucratic challenges uh, and clerical challenges. And yet, I go around and I talk to a lot of guys when I'm there. You know, I told them, they asked me what the young guy signed me up for VA had never served in the military but for three weeks and maybe boot camp before he had a physical problem, had to go. He said, well, what rank were you? I'm just like this, you know, running a suit, go down, look important. And I said, well, I, I just did the Marine infantry. And he said, oh, okay. He said, what's the abbreviation for that? And I said, he asked me my rank. I think it's INF infantry, you know, INF. So now when they call me to the desk, when I go to VA, they say, well, Inf Madison, I'm your desk. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
who know me are just giggling. They, they realize what a joke <laughs> So I tried to, but the reason I did that was, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to try and get a standard fare. Because you won't believe how many people want to burp you when you're a four-star general. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just tell you, the VA scheme is very, very good in the care. I had a young guy who couldn't get his prosthetic leg that he'd driven four hours down to Denver from, I think, up in Montana or Wyoming somewhere. And he got a hold of me and I said, let me work. It took me three days. And I finally found a, a lady, a nurse, and she said, you give me my cell phone number, you tell him to come down here, he will not leave my side until his prosthetic leg is fixed. And they move heaven. These are great doctors and nurses. But boy, I'll tell you, the, the administrative bureaucracy, Mm. You know, that's something I can't describe with ladies for it. We reorganized Now under the State Department and the Broadcast Board of Governors, Secretary Clint would just pull out her hair out trying to get them to answer the very question that you just asked. Um, if you, you know, one thing for you young folks who are going to come up in industry and business and education and military, institutions get the behavior they reward. And if you don't reward people who can go out and argue this thing, and sometimes they're kind of bizarre people, like Good Morning Vietnam, you know, you want to these kind of people to turn to. Uh, but you need to, like I brought in a bunch of young folks, but I had some people who actually fought it out over the internet. They'd go into these chat rooms, and I had guys and gals, both of them, born in the Middle East, now American citizens, they'd go back They'd be, they'd be fighting it out and arguing right there in the chat room. And they said, let's do this. Y'all went to the South Park, you young people fight about it. <laughs> anyway, they said, use South Park ridicule because they can't take ridicule. So these people were, were doing that sort of thing. We need some of you young people who are very irreverent, but very disciplined to define this enemy, understand this enemy, and then go after them with the marine aggressiveness of a bayonet and fight it out. And you young folks have got to get into this game. This is not, we are not going to turn over to you a good world if you guys don't sign on. And with the all-volunteer uh, military now, many of you think, don't realize that countries like the bank, you got to put something into it if you want to take something out of it. And we need young people to put something into this experiment that you and I call America. And that's all it is, is an experiment. There's nothing to say it's going to survive. Every generation is going to have to fight for it and pay a price for it at a time that's very, very heavy. And I think that we need your kind of thinking and questioning in Washington, D.C., more than we need a broadcast board of governors who are self a nice green cone that don't know how to fight it out with the enemy. And we're the revolutionary in the world. We're the violent ones. We think we all have the right to run our own country. That's a revolutionary idea. And we're starting to act like a bunch of funny duddy You know, real careful, cautious people. We need to get a lot more aggressive. I think that's uh, Wanda. Oh, there you are. I guess.
you would like to join us in making contributions to that fund. Please do so. Thank you, thank you for coming, and we hope we'll see you again. Bye-bye.